Hey everyone, it's Ashley with National Quilter Circle and welcome to our July live event. Once again, we have Susan Guzman back to answer your quilting questions. So thanks for being here, Susan. Oh, absolutely, Ashley. It's so great to be here and I can't wait to get started. <laughs> Perfect. So if this is your first time tuning in, you've never watched one of these before, I just want to remind you that you can ask questions live to Susan for the next hour. You can do that by typing your question into the comment box below this video and we'll just work through as many questions as we can go through. So our first question is from Erin and she wants to know how you join strips using diagonal seams. Okay. Well, I actually, um, we, uh, um, we're kind of preparing for this because we were thinking uh, someone would answer that for us. And um, I actually put some samples uh, together. So what you actually do, this is the quickest way that I think you, you can join pieces. So this is for uh, border strips, any border strips that you uh, cut with the fabric. Let's say you need 10 with the fabric um, border strips. Uh, in order to make your all four borders uh, or border sides. Um, so what you do is you take one of your strips, and of course these are a lot smaller than what they would be, and uh, you lay one on top of the other with the right sides together, okay? And what you wanna do is line up those corners, your, your corner right here, and just make sure it's um, level on all uh, two sides here. Okay, and then um, what you'll wanna do is draw a pencil mark, a line from uh, this corner to this lower corner here and pin it together. And what you do is sew on that uh, marked line. Um, I've, I've been told uh, some people actually take that instead of drawing the line, they fold this corner down and they crease it, uh, finger press it. And they use that as their guide instead of um, drawing those um, uh, diagonal lines each time. So anyway, you sew on that diagonal line and you end up with your unit looking like this. Okay, you, you cut off, um, leave a quarter inch seam allowance and you cut off that corner. Um, you can toss that or reuse it if you wish. And then you just um, press that open. And then you have a really nice even edge on both sides. Now, um, there are um, people who teach, let me see, people who teach to arrange your pieces like this. Um, can you see that real well where there's like, um, okay, like, and they say to uh, draw your liner or even just sew from this uh, corner uh, down to this point here. My problem with that is, see, even as I'm holding it like that, that can be become a little bit skewed as you sew. That's why I line up those corners. Um, and then you have a, a really straight seam and uh, everything goes together really easily. So that's how I do it. Perfect. I am actually in between those two methods. So you line up exactly. Some people say to offset by a quarter. I offset by the width of what I think that thread is going to take up. So I mean, it's a couple thread width of fabric and just by that tiny bit. And if you ever find that you are doing your strips and then you open it up and you kind of have a little unevenness when you fold them open, maybe try offsetting them just a little bit and see if that works good for you. And that's definitely something you want to do if you either can't stay on the line that you draw perfectly, um, you can offset them a bit and then there's a little bit more forgiveness in that. Okay. Yeah. I, I just have always um, done it this way. I, I've just always personally had problems with that. Uh, and it doesn't matter like how much you offset that. It doesn't have to be like a quarter inch. It can be anything really, uh, supposedly. Um, but I don't know. I just would personally not recommend doing that just because of the shifting that can occur. Perfect. And now I'm going to tell you a super cheesy way to remember which way to sew your your diagonal line, right? So hold your pieces back up again. Oh, sure. So where they're at. Okay. Okay, so you have one long road coming in one way. You have another long road going in another way and you have to sew it so you block off those dead ends so nobody drives down the dead end. So Ooh. that way you know to, to sew, so you're just cutting off that, that triangle because if you sew the wrong direction, your strips aren't opening up at all. Excellent. So I had somebody taught me that once that it was, I don't know, it's just kind of cheesy, but it's an easy way to remember. Oh, which way to sew your seam. I think that's a great suggestion. 
<laughs> Perfect. All right, our next question here, um, we had someone who asked, how do you make flying geese using a no waste method? Oh gosh, okay. Um, there, There is a way to do it. Um, let me preface this by saying that if you want your fabric, your base fabric of the flying geese unit, so not those corner triangles, just that big triangle in the center, if you have directional fabric, you wanna do it sort of the old fashioned way. Um, you want to cut all of your uh, base strips um, going in the direction that you want the fabric to live in your quilt um, or your quilt block. And then, um, you'll end up having everything going in the same direction that you want it to go in. When you use the no waste flying geese method, um, you're going to have that directional fabric going in a couple of different ways. Now, you might want it to go that way and be okay with that. And, you know, it adds like a little bit of character to your quilt. So if you want to do that, that's fine as well. Um, I'll just give an example. I would recommend that you look up, there are charts uh, out on the internet and just um, type in um, fast flying geese or no waste flying geese. Uh, and just as an example, I'm going to uh, give you, uh, I had to print this off because I couldn't remember. Um, but uh, let's say you want a finished unit that's two inches by four inches. Um, uh, what you will be doing is cutting four of the smaller, four of the, the uh, corner uh, triangles, you'll be cutting four squares, two and seven eighths inches. So how you can sort of remember this, if you have um, two whole numbers of your finished unit, the two, two inches by four inches, um, take that two inches and normally you cut those uh, squares if you're doing a stitch and flip, you normally cut those two and a half by two and a half. Um, uh, just remember to bump that up to seven eighths. Uh, instead of two and a half, you want to cut those two and seven eighths. Then um, uh, for the large portion of the flying geese units, uh, you want to uh, cut one large square five and a quarter inches. So think of it this way. It's a two by four inch, um, two inch by four inch finished unit. Um, bump up that that larger number by one and a quarter inches. Okay, and then that will there then there's um, a, a way of doing it. I apologize. I wish I uh, could have prepared something for this, but um, uh, in opposing corners, you place your first two squares, small squares, on the large square. Um, and uh, you know what? It's probably best. I. When you can show you can show your little diagram to show them what you have and just so they, they print it off just so you can say, you know, this is what you can find online. This is something yeah. that you can see. I kind of don't like doing it because of copyright uh, oh. infringement. Um, okay, well. because, um, I, I, I would just rather not do it. That's totally fine. For that. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Okay. Well, what we will sum this up as is there are probably what four or five, maybe six different ways that you can do flying geese. There are many different ways that you can put them together. Some yeah. that maybe I hate to say waste fabric, but use more fabric than others. Um, and you just kind of use whatever is your preferred method and whatever way works best with whatever prints of fabric you have exactly. or whatever design you're going for. Yeah. yeah. I think that sounds great. Awesome. <laughs> All right, our next question here is from Megan, and she wants to know, is there a benefit to pressing seams open as opposed to one direction or the other? Um, the, the benefits of pressing open. Um, I know that in garment sewing, is this correct, Ashley? Seams are typically pressed open, is that correct? It depends on what you're doing with it. If you're gonna finish a seam, like a French seam or a flat felt seam, you, you do press to one direction, so you can fold it up and over, so it's, it kind of depends on the garment. Oh, okay. okay. For some reason, I was thinking that that whole idea came from garment sewing. Um, but um, I would say the best thing to do, uh, especially if you're sending your quilt out to be quilted, most quilters like for the for you to press uh, in one direction. And uh, the rule of thumb is to press toward the darker fabric. And reason being, um, if you press towards the light, it, uh, you can see that seam um, through your quilt. Quite honestly, I don't really think it matters so much because by the time your quilt is quilted, you don't even see that. 
especially if um, you are using a lighter colored batting. There are dark battings out there, there are black battings, but uh, typically you use either an off-white or a white uh, batting, so those seams you won't even see. Um, I would suggest that uh, if you're making a block, let's say you find one on the internet and you're putting that together, and you're piecing and you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's not making sense with this one patch to press towards the dark, then don't do it. Because when you go to uh, put a, uh, sew a couple of units together, if it makes more sense to, um, to press towards the, the lighter color, go for it. And what I mean by that is when you press, when you sew two pieces that have been pieced together, um, you wanna sort of think through, okay, are these pieces all going to sort of fit together like a puzzle, or am I going to have several um, uh, seam allowances that are going to be piled on top of each other, and those shift when you go to sew those pieces together. Does that make sense? Yes, yep, it does. And I know, because um, you have some experience writing patterns, and a lot of times I know that you add pressing instructions in with your patterns, right? So if there's an, an absolute reason to press one one way or another, usually a pattern designer will tell you that, correct? Yes, and not all um, not all patterns are written with um, pressing instructions, so you'd sort of have to get in the habit of looking ahead if you don't see pressing instructions. I just recommend that you kind of look ahead and see uh, which way to go. And of course, you know, at the last minute, if you're sewing those two together and you're getting that and it's like, oh darn, I pressed that the wrong way, just stop what you're doing, go to your ironing board and go ahead and press it, press one of those seams in the opposite direction and you'll be fine. Perfect. All right, our next question here, this is from Kilo. What is the secret to applying iron-on interfacing and not having it bubble up after being pressed? I follow the directions, but it seems like I can never get it adhered smoothly. Oh, okay. Um, I think I know what you mean. Um, they, you know, for the most part, I've never seen my iron-on um, be pressed like completely flat. I usually see some sort of rippling um, but if you just be very careful about your iron not being uh, too hot, um, so that that's what I would recommend is that you just make sure that your iron isn't too hot. That's probably the best advice I can give. Uh, the other thing is perhaps go to the manufacturer's website and there could be um, Q and A's, um, uh, fre frequently asked questions, a list of those on their site uh, that might be able to um, uh, direct you a little further. Yep, and I'm just gonna do a quick follow-up just in case, because I think you're referring to iron-on batting, refusable batting. Oh, no, no, I was talking about uh, fusible web, you said, right? Or interfacing, yeah. Yep. Interfacing? Okay. okay, fusible web, same thing. So, I mean, what, what I'm uh, understanding is that, like there's paperback fusible web, for instance. Um, where there's uh, paper on one side, then you have the woven um, interfacing, and then uh, then you press that to your base fabric. Uh, that's that's what I was thinking. I don't know. Maybe I missed yeah. the question. No, that that's definitely one kind of. I'm, I I guess my mind because you asked me a garment sewing question, so now I'm in like garment sewing mode, and so <laughs> I'm thinking of like interfacing to stiffen a collar where there is no paperback. You just press it right on there, and so I was just gonna say if you have issues and mm -hmm. you know your iron maybe doesn't run exactly where it's supposed to in terms of heat settings, so you don't know if it's too hot or not, to just use a press cloth between your um your fabric and your iron to just kind of help protect it, just in case. You know, I, and I think I was probably talking about a totally different product. So There's so I, many fusibles out there, so I, cover I them all. I was, I was specifically talking about paperback, but you're right. I just recently used, um, I'm making these small blocks for uh, another challenge, and um, I ended up using a product where uh, you just iron that on, and I think it's exactly what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, you do need to use a pressing cloth so it doesn't, what the glue doesn't seep out onto your iron. Yeah. That's what happened to me. <laughs> okay. How do you clean that off your iron? Um, well, what I ended up doing is um, it was on there pretty good. So I just got some goo gone and I just uh, cleaned my iron up that way. And then I washed the iron, the faceplate, uh, unplugged, of course. <laughs> and, um, yeah. We don't want any anyone getting hurt. Perfect. All right. Our next question here, this is from Jackie. And she wants to know, 
If you have a quilt block that you finished and you layer it with just a piece of backing fabric, maybe do some stitching to hold it, hold it together, but there's no batting, is it a quilt? Um, yeah, actually, technically they say that it is a quilt. Uh, you're saying with, with a block. Well, yeah, because I guess, I mean, it can be any size. Mm -hmm. a, a quilt can be the size of a block. It can be the size of, you know, many blo blocks put together. But I've made quilts where um, actually it's, um, they call it quilt as you go. And I just used a flannel as my backing. And I took just strips of fabric and right sides together, or I'm sorry, I guess it would be wrong side of the, well, it was flannel. So flannel's two-sided. Mm -hmm. um, I just laid um, the wrong side up, uh, did my stitching, flipped it up, you know, pressed it out, and then just laid the next one on. So um that's considered a quilt so i would say yeah. I was, we were talking about this earlier just because i wasn't sure if you had to have batting in between your layers for it to be a quilt like if you had to have three layers for a quilt to be a quilt no not, no not necessarily and i actually worked on uh, david butler's book um and uh his book i'm trying to think um i don't think i have it right here but um in his book um i made all of his, well, I would say probably 90% of the quilts that are in that book. And we just used uh, flannel uh, backing for many of them. Perfect. All right, Karen wants to know, what is your favorite type of batting and how do I pick which one to use? Um, I actually, one of the battings that I've been using and oh gosh, I apologize, it's been so long since I got any, I, I, he, uh, the gentleman just usually sends it to me on rolls. Um, oh gosh. Um, why don't I, I'll add, uh, the, um, the link to his company. Uh, he's just a small company out of uh, Michigan. And for whatever reason, his, his company name's kind of slipping me. I just haven't dealt with him in a long time, but I love his batting and it's, uh, very priced very nicely. But I, I use, um, uh, uh, 80 20 cotton polyester. I used to use 100% cotton, but um, because uh, my quilts, most of my quilts uh, are made for either magazines or um, some other um, business promotion of uh, the fabrics. So um, they lay so much nicer, the quilts lay so much nicer when you use that uh, extra 20% polyester. Well, I think we've talked about this in the past too, where cotton batting can shrink a bit, but that you actually like that look maybe of um, what if you don't pre-wash your cotton batting and you put it in your quilt and you do all your quilting, you wash it and it shrinks a little bit. It kind of has that like vintage rumpled look kind of. Yeah. 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 That's what I like. And actually this, this quilt here has, has a really nice look to it like that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I just love that. I, I don't like to pre-wash my batting. <laughs> we might have mentioned that before too. <laughs> Perfect. All right, now I wanna talk a little bit about the challenge just because we are coming towards the end of it a little bit. We're getting close to wrapping everything up. So if someone is watching this and they don't know a thing about the challenge, Susan is currently hosting our uh, NQC Quilt Block Challenge, which is in week eight right now. But if you haven't started yet you can still start and um, you don't have to worry about trying to catch up you can make it at your own pace but sort of where are we at in the challenge and what are we working on right now well like you said we're in week eight actually today is the last day of week eight tomorrow starts week nine and it will be the final week of the challenge um, what I did was I designed a quilt called a Lexington sampler and um, it consists of um, I always have to count them in my head two four six eight 10, 12, 12 blocks, but you're only making six different block designs. You're just making two of each. And then we have um, a bonus block for the center if you care to use it, or you can either place, place your own um, uh, block. You can choose a block yourself to place in the center. Um, but week eight was uh, finishing up the throw size and the throw and the, and the uh, bed size quilts are essentially the same quilts, but we just add borders on uh, for the bed size quilt. Perfect. All right, our next one here, Molly wants to know, what are your tips for getting an accurate quarter inch seam allowance every time? Um, what I recommend that you do, because every sewing machine sews differently, 
every sewer sews differently. So it's almost like you have to build this relationship with your sewing machine. Um, and what I suggest that you do is uh, sew three strips together that are one and a half by three and a half inches. And those should finish, after you sew all three of those together, uh, your unit should measure three and a half by three and a half inches. Uh, if it does not, then that's when you have to make your adjustments. Um, I personally, with my sewing machine, I want to preface it with that, with my sewing machine, I achieve the best quarter inch seam allowances when I sew um, a scant quarter inch seam. Um, I found it doesn't happen with every sewing machine though. I have a vintage sewing machine that I have to uh, sew an exact quarter inch uh, seam allowance. And I have my, I have marks on my um, sewing machine that I use as guides. Um, I, that sounds a little crazy, but it's, that's what happens. Um, so uh, one other suggestion I would make is um, you can, if you're just starting out sewing, you could um, mark quarter inch seam allowances on the wrong side of your fabric, the top fabric that you're sewing together to a bottom piece of fabric. Uh, you can sew a seam and then just sew right on that, uh, on that uh, marked line and that'll give you a quarter inch seam. Perfect. And I actually, I'm probably reading your mind, Ashley. Um, there are also quarter, quarter inch uh, seam allowance feet that you can buy for your sewing machine. Personally, I don't use one, and um, I had trouble with one at one time a long time ago. So I don't use one. I just kind of see a spot on my sewing machine as I'm sewing. And if I, if I get my fabric to meet that sweet spot, I like to call it, then I, I typically don't have any issues with my quarter inch seams. But it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of practice. Right. I actually have, I think, three different quarter inch feet, actually. One, is, yeah, one um, just is the one that came with the machine, uh, and it just has, you know, a very small section on the right when you're looking at it, and that's where you line up your quarter inch. And then one actually has a little flange on it that you just make sure your fabric is sort of butted up against it, and then that's right at your quarter inch, too. So there are... I have to... Can you keep talking? I actually have to plug my... Um, my um, computer. computer is dying. I didn't realize I'm running so low on battery, so I'll be right back. I All right, well, well, Susan runs off to get that. We'll talk a little bit about quarter inch feet, and then we have a little bit more to talk about in terms of pressing fabric, which is going to be our next question if she hears me while she's walking away. But so, in terms of quarter inch feet, like she's saying, you don't have to use one, and I know a lot of people don't want to take the time to have to draw that mark on their um, fabric to line it up every time. So if your quarter inch foot doesn't have a flange or something that you can butt it up to really quickly or easily, um, you can put something on the throat plate of your machine. So we've talked a little bit before that there are even companies out there that make sort of this sticky tape and it's got some thickness to it and you can put that at your quarter inch. Um, we have had someone in the past who's mentioned that they use moleskin um, which has some thickness to it as well and that's what they use to sort of mark their quarter inch and it just goes right up to it and it goes perfect. So any of those tips should help you get your perfect accurate quarter inch seam. And now that Susan's back, <laughs> our next question. Um, that. No, that's fine. I'm glad you plugged it in before it died. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, Paula wants to know if using too much steam can damage your fabric. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily, well, that's a good, that's a really good question. Uh, okay, do you use say, steam? Do I use steam? I do not, no, okay. I do not. Um, uh, ruin your fabric. It could distort your fabric. I wouldn't say necessarily ruin it, but it can distort your fabric. Um, yeah, I would just suggest, and I just always do suggest uh, that you there's really you really don't need steam. I would just use like some sort of a pressing spray um, along with um, because that soaks into your fabric a little bit, and just just press. You know, I wouldn't like um, uh, go back and forth too much and just be gentle with your pressing. I think you and I are exact opposite human beings because I use, I put my iron on like the highest steam setting and I even like hit the button to get extra steam. But so you, mes you mentioned a pressing solution. What, what would you use for that? What is that? 
No, I said pressing spray. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. What is that? Well, a, a pressing spray. Um, it's so funny because I just learned something just recently. I didn't know that there was a difference between starch and um, oh, what do they call it? Um, best press. But, uh, no, not well. Yeah, I guess it would be best press, but um, sizing. Oh yeah. Uh, I to me it was all the same, but uh, starch actually has. Uh, it's actually a. Um, I believe a corn base to it. So if you think food, you know, uh, that attracts um, uh, insects. And if you're in, in an area of the country or if you're watching us from around the world and you're in an area where there's a lot of insects um, and you store your quilts and haven't washed them, then you want to just be sure to use maybe a sizing. And sizing is more of a synthetic based product. So. Okay. Yes, and um, if if you're someone who has watched these live events for a long time, um, several, several months back, we had another woman who talked about making her own starch, or she had a friend who made her own starch, simply like essentially juicing a potato. Like she got, that's how she got her starch, and that's what she would use. And she would use that, but then as soon as she was done, she would immediately wash that out and get rid of it. So I guess, yeah, if you are uh, not sure if your starch is made of something that could attract something unwanted, then go ahead and just wash that like as soon as you're done. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. All right. Um, I just want to remind people we have about a half hour left. So if you have any questions that you want to ask, go ahead and type those into the comment box. Um, our next one here, this is from Teresa and she wants to know what is the difference between a quarter inch and a scant quarter inch? A scant quarter inch, uh, well, of course, you know, quarter inch is quarter inch. A uh, scant quarter inch is one or two threads less, uh, um, than a quarter inch when you're sewing. Um, so um, when you're putting it under your presser foot, what you want to do is, and I know this is sort of backwards for you, but just think of sitting in my seat. What you want to do is move your fabric uh, just one or two threads to the left and uh, then sew your fabrics together. And um, uh, again, it's kind of like... Um, uh, figuring out what that sweet spot is on your sewing machine uh, so that you can sort of eyeball that and that's what a scant would be. And what is, I guess, what is the opposite of a scant quarter inch seam? Is there such a thing? Um, no, uh, not in quilting. There's okay. not, no, it's either a quarter inch or a scant quarter inch. And then would there be a time when you, like, I know you said you like to use it specifically with your machine, but say you're trying to put together maybe um, some you have a row of blocks and you have another row of blocks and you want them to fit together perfectly. Would you try and sort of adjust your quarter inch seam up or down to make things line up like they're supposed to? Um, is there, I guess, a time where you would want to use that scant quarter inch seam, even if it's not something you always do with your sewing like you do? Um, I don't know, Ashley, it really depends on how everybody sews. It's kind of a tough question to answer. Right. Uh, I would say, you know, one instance where I would say for the most part that you do want to sort of concentrate more on a scant quarter inch seam is when you're sewing blocks together that have a lot of pieces along the edge, there's a lot of seams that you're dealing with. Because just think of it this way, when you, when you sew those pieces together and you go to open that all up, you know, there's always that that seam is not always perfect. So you have to like really, really press that well. And when you go to open that up, um, it kind of adds a little bit of extra bulk. You know, whether you like it or not, there's a little bit of an extra bulk there. And um, when you use that quarter inch seam, like, for instance, if you're um, uh, finishing a quilt and um, uh, it happens to be like a real scrappy quilt and there's all sorts of pieces. That's when I would recommend that, you know, if it doesn't typically, if all those, say you, you have a lot of even star points along those edges that you're sewing together, if, if you're clipping off those star points, start trying to use a scant quarter inch seam and um, I bet you'll be able to nail those and you'll be able to have your full, those full points that you want. Perfect. All right, our next question here, I am hand quilting my latest quilt, never tried it before. What is the correct way to end my thread and begin another? Do I just tie a knot and hide it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. 
All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, what kind of knot do you tie and how do you hide your thread? What's that? What kind of knot do you tie and how do you hide your thread? Um, well, I just, um, I, I, I know that there's different ways of tying knots. Mm -hmm. I just um, wrap the thread around my finger and just sort of move it off to the end and then take my fingernail and pull it. And that's how I knot it. And then uh, what you want to do is, so let's say that that knot, you knotted it at the back side of your uh, quilt sandwich. Then what you want to do is just take your thread and just sort of tug it and it should pop right into the center. Um, so that's, that's how you hide, like to say, start, um, start a new um, row of stitching. So then what kind of knot do you tie like you're you're done with a row of stitching and you have like a little bit of thread left and you need to put more thread on your needle how do you end um that little bit so you can re-thread your needle oh, okay um, i'm trying to think it's been so long since i've done that um, um i don't know that there's one right or wrong answer i'm just asking if you have a, a preference in not tying well actually there is a right answer for that uh, and um but <laughs> I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I've done anything like that before. Um, I think what I've done in the past is just uh, tie a knot on the on the top with your. So you you, let's say you have a piece of thread that's sticking up at the top. Uh, tie your your new thread to that as close as you can to the uh, surface, mm -hmm. and uh, then you can pop that through with your next stitch. That's one way of doing it. That's, I think that's a good way. I've actually never done that before. I always just try to get to uh, maybe an intersection point, a seam between two blocks, and I try to tie a knot and hide it kind of down in that seam. So that's a, but I think your way is better, trying to get it down between those layers so that way you don't have any knots on the surface. Right, right. Perfect. All right, our next question here, we want to know how do you trim threads when you have beginnings and ends in a quilt? So. I'm assuming they mean when they're quilting, you have beginning and ends of threads that you have to trim. Um, you mean like, oh gosh, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. That. Read it again. It says, um, how do you clip threads when you have beginnings and ends of, of threads in your quilting? I took that to mean if someone's doing like long arm quilting and they have they ended something because they don't normally backstitch. They sort of just overlap the beginning and ends of threads. And so you have some thread tails. Can you just clip those away or do you have to maybe put those down in between the layers of the quilt? Well, I, I think that anytime you have, let, let's say, it, it's kind of, we kind of almost already answered that, you know, in the last question, I, I think. Yeah. You know, where where you, you don't want to have like any threads sticking up. You do want to try and bury those as much as you can. Um, let's say you do have a long thread that happens to be there and maybe you're doing long arm quilting, just thread a needle on it and then poke it back through, you know, to the, uh, to the wrong side and do that technique that I said, just, uh, you know, try and get a knot close to that surface and then pull it back up and um, uh, pull it and bring your needle back up through, yank it so that you get your, um, your thread in between the layers and then what I like to do is I like to sort of over pull my thread before I clip it. And then that kind of disappears between the layers. Maybe that helps. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right, and next one here, is there a specific detergent made for washing quilts? Um, actually there are, um, however, and actually, I, I should pre preface that by saying, I know that there are concerns say like with, um, Oh, vintage quilt tops or uh, vintage um, quilts or antique quilts that get staining on them. And there is a product out there. I apologize. I don't know the name of it right off the top of my head, but I'll go ahead and um, look that up. And Ashley, um, I'm going to put the onus on you <laughs> to remind me to do this. I can do that. Um, okay. But yeah, absolutely. There, there are some products and actually there's I know this sounds crazy, but there's actually a, um, a product that you can pick up at the farm store. And it's um, actually um, uh, to wash horses. Um, uh, I, I know it sounds crazy, but um, a lot of uh, um, antiquarian uh, quilt experts, uh, they swear by that. 
but again, well, so I'm, I'm definitely going to remember to remind you because I really want to know what this horse product is now that you're yeah, using. I'm pretty sure it's for horses, for washing horses, but it's, I guess it just cleans so well that, you know, for some reason, somebody tried it on a quilt one time and it happens to take out the stains and all of that sort of thing. Um, with that said, my quilts, my everyday quilts that I use, like the ones behind me, I just throw them in the wash. Some people might cringe about that, um, especially people who, um, you know, are uh, just um, uh, very loyal to the quilting process and um, trying to uh, keep their quilts in the best condition so they can um, uh, give them to um, um, relatives and whatnot. Uh, after they pass or whatever, and they want to keep their quilts in really good, pristine condition. Um, however, I like my quilts to be that really nice, um, comfortable look. And um, uh, so typically, you know, they when I go to wash them, I just I just use regular soap. I even use condition or not the conditioner. What is it? Um, softener. Softener. I even okay. use softener. And I'm sure people are cringing out there, but that's what I do. I like things to smell nice and I, I use my quilts. So, you know, that's what I do. Perfect. All right. Next question here. Um, someone says they're having problems with flying geese. Is there such a thing as a two, two piece template to use for making flying geese? Uh, I would imagine that there are. Um, I, I'm not aware of any. Um, and I apologize. I'm not really a gadget girl. I really don't uh, have a lot of, uh, extra templates or that sort of thing. Um, I do believe that there are some out on the market and I believe that there are some uh, quilting templates uh, that do help you uh, make very accurate um, flying geese units. So what I'd suggest is that you do a search online and you can find the, find those sorts of products that way. Absolutely. And I was going to say, even if you can't find the template, you can find, um, like we were talking about earlier, a resource that tells you uh, what size to cut your triangle specifically for what finish size you want your flying geese just because you can make them in so many different sizes and then you can either you know use a manila folder some cardstock paper go buy template plastic template paper and sort of make your own and that might be um, a more cost-effective way especially if you want to make a bunch of different sized flying geese definitely yep. perfect all right Joanne says she is a new quilter while sewing, my material seems to want to slide to the left, which in turn I feel I am constantly fighting to keep it at a quarter inch seam. Do you have a trick or what do I need to check or change on my machine? She has a baby lock. A baby lock. Um, not as familiar about uh, or with the baby lock products other than I, I've heard that they, they're just awesome quilting machines. Um, with any slippage that you're, uh, that's occurring, one thing you might want to check is uh, to insert as many pins as you can along your edges as they go under or right before they go under the presser foot. Um, that can help a lot with slippage. Uh, and then just take it slow. Sometimes it's just a matter of, um, uh, you know, if you go a little too fast, sometimes things get skewed a little bit with uh, the feed dogs and it can get a little crazy. But those are, um, that's one, one thing that I would recommend is use more pins and then also place your hand on top of, hopefully you're working with larger pieces. If you're working with smaller pieces, that's a little tougher. But um, just uh, place your hand flat on uh, obviously the outside of your uh, presser foot and um, try and keep everything stable that way as well. Perfect, I would say the only time I think I have well, I won't say only time. The main time I have an issue is if I'm sewing a really, really long strip and the more fabric you get behind your machine, if it's kind of going towards the right, then it makes the other half kind of want to go towards the left. So if you can reach your hand through and maybe use both hands to make sure that it's feeding straight underneath your presser foot or even just stopping every now and then to sort of um, adjust the pile of fabric, maybe that's accumulating behind your machine to make sure that that's going straight, that should help. Um, everything feed under nicely also. Yeah, and Ashley, um, one other thing is as you're sewing, especially it kind of, um, uh, something went off in my mind as you were saying that with long pieces, just stop every now and then and just make sure you, you look. As you're sewing, of course, your eye is typically right where the needle is. 
and just kind of look uh, ahead or you know towards you at your pieces and just make sure that those are still together. And again, using a lot of pins really does help. Um, uh, you know, even in particular with smaller pieces. You know, oh yeah, that that really helps as well. So. Perfect. All right, our next one here. I don't know if you're going to be able to do this or not, but Karen says, "Can you give us a look at the border for tomorrow?" Oh. Um, if you don't have it like right there with you, can you just describe it a little? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, uh, the border is actually with uh, all of the material. I mean, you've seen the border um, if you're uh, in the the class. Um, if you're, I'm sorry, in the in the group itself, and you've been receiving uh, all of the materials, the PDFs. Um, uh, but the borders themselves, um, I yeah, I don't have the quilt here with me. Uh, so I can't show you the quilt itself. It's sounding, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of hesitating because it's sounding to me like maybe um, Karen isn't in the class or, or she hasn't been uh, doing the challenge. Potentially, or um, say I'm someone who signed up for the challenge and like me, I just made the bed size quilt and that's the one I downloaded. So I don't specifically have the pattern that shows what the, um, or I'm sorry, the throw size, so they don't have the bed size one. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe they're just not sure what exactly it looks like, but maybe oh, just a little, that, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, actually the, the very first packet um, does, I believe, the yeah, the very first packet does show an image of what the borders look like. So, and of course they're attached in the image, it's a digital, digital image, but um, you can see the borders just in the very first packet. Perfect. So yes, Karen, if you haven't looked at it yet or you haven't downloaded or maybe you just signed up for the challenge, either go to the Facebook page and look at week one file or go to the website, uh, nationalquiltercircle.com, search for Lexington Sampler and you can find the week one file on there as well and you'll see the beautiful pictures, including the border. Mm -hmm. All right. Next one here, Michelle says, I enjoy seeing a quilting design included with a pattern. Do you have a particular quilting pattern in mind that could be used for the Lexington Sampler quilt? I am a new long arm quilter and I'm having trouble figuring out what quilting design would look the best on a block. Thank you for a great quilt along. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm really glad you were able to join us. Um, I actually, I, I do not include, typically I do not include um, uh, any quilting, um, I don't know, uh, patterns or uh, visuals um, for quilts. Uh, I usually leave that to the experts. And I say that because I, I'm not a quilter. I'm not a person who, like it's not part of my profession to do the actual act of quilting the layers together. Um, unfortunately, um, my skills don't, don't, they're just not there. <laughs> Um, so what I do is I just kind of, uh, just to give you some tips though, is since you have a long arm, arm machine, I know that you can go out on the internet and, and uh, um, uh, get some tips that way on say like an all over edge to edge type uh, quilting pattern. Um, then uh, besides that, what I would recommend is look at each block. And since you have done the challenge, you have that coloring page. And um, what I would recommend is just sort of play around with, with each one of those coloring pages, the blank coloring pages of the blocks. And um, maybe do, say like in one section, let's say you have a triangular section on one of the blocks. You might want to do some um, sort of, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Like an a, arc. An arc. Yeah, an arc or like a, a reverse arc. Uh, to, uh, around all four sides of um, your rectangle. You could do something like that. You could do a lot of straight lines. Um, you could do uh, meandering in certain spots, say like your, your background fabrics. Uh, you could do some meandering and then emphasize um, either uh, say like um, echo or shadow quilting. Echo and shadow quilting is, are essentially the same thing. And what you're doing is you're taking that shape and you're either um, sewing directly inside of uh, whatever your seams are or directly outside. Um, so you could do some of those uh, types of things. And again, like 
Uh, so say like um, maybe a quarter inch inside of that shape, and then you could do another quarter inch inside, so you could sort of echo that whole uh, section. Um, uh, so that's what I would recommend. I, I'm so sorry. That's one thing that I'm just not very good at uh, is um, recommending. No, and I don't think you should apologize. And I also think that if anyone else out there is someone who just only enjoys the piecing and the designing and that part, you're still considered a quilter. You're still making a quilt. So I don't think you have to necessarily always quilt your own quilt to be a quilter. I know some people have differing opinions on that, but I feel like if you're still the one designing and making it, it is still your quilt. Um, yeah. But I definitely agree that you should take advantage of those coloring pages and sort of just doodle on there and see if you like uh, what something looks like. and um, maybe do a different design on each different block. It is, like you said, it's kind of a, a sampler quilt. So you have a bunch of different blocks. You don't necessarily have to do the same quilting design or motif or whatever on each block. You can do something different on each, right? Absolutely. And um, you know what? I One other thing I would like to um, to bring up, and I'll, I'll actually share it in my video tomorrow. I'll be doing a quick, usually 10 minute video. It might go a little bit longer since we're at the end. But um, right around three o'clock uh, Mountain Standard Time, um, I do a video uh, on that. Uh, we'll be in week nine, so I'll be doing a video on week nine, just finishing up the bed size quilt. And um, uh, I will mention there's um, a Facebook group that has been so helpful to me. I just need to finish through the process, but it's a group that helps you. Uh, do quilting on your home machine and it helps you sort of get used to uh, quilting and there are little uh, test um, patches um, that you can do and that um, this the woman who started the group uh, she kind of teaches you through a PDF on uh, how, how to do different shapes and that sort of thing and I bet that might be helpful to her to Karen right it was Karen uh, Michelle, that's oh, one yeah, Michelle. Absolutely. Yep, Karen yeah. wanted to know about the border. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay. okay, now if you're going to go um, kind of the same route that both you and I went with our quilt, is once we had it finished, uh, we actually both sent it to the same person to have it quilted. Um, but if if I am somebody who doesn't have you to recommend specifically who I should send my quilt to, uh, how do you go about finding a long arm quilter, and what do you tell them in terms of what you want uh, quilted on your quilt? Well, uh, what I like to do, um, I mean, I, I'm actually the perfect example for that because, um, you know, there, uh, even when I go to give my quilt to someone, I usually like to ask their feedback. Um, and uh, quilters are more than happy to help um, sort of guide you into uh, what types of designs because everybody has different tastes. So, you know, you might be more contemporary. So you like more graphic designs on your uh, quilt top. And um, then you might be uh, someone who is a little bit more traditional and maybe you like florals or some sort of vine type um, uh, quilting done. And I'm talking edge to edge. Uh, then, you know, on the other side, there's uh, custom quilting. And uh, custom quilting can just be, I mean, it, they, the patterns can just blow you, your mind. Um, to find a new quilter, I would recommend going to your local quilt shop, calling them. Uh, if you're in more of a remote area, um, uh, if you're part of a group, ask for recommendations. Um, uh, Penny Barnes is the gal who quilted my quilt and Ashley's quilt. And actually I'll be doing a blog post uh, on her company, on her business, and just uh, my dealings with her. And she's just a delightful girl. And um, uh, I'd be more than happy to share her uh, contact information. Um, and uh, she can either do everything she does is custom, even her edge to edge. But, um, uh, and what I mean by that is there are certain quilting machines that you, uh, the quilter can just program a certain design in and they can walk away and that design is being sewn directly onto your quilt top without them interfering whatsoever. Um, they don't do anything, they just walk away and they, they go work on something else and your quilt is being quilted. But Penny actually stands there and even if it's an edge to edge, 
um, she'll stand there and she'll customize that same edge to edge all over your quilt. Perfect. I feel like that um, the computerized one sounds perfect for me. I would like to just hit go and then have it done. Uh, one thing I did just find out that is available at quilt shops um, is if you're someone who is maybe thinking about wanting to do your own long arm quilting, but maybe buying a machine is a really big investment and you aren't ready for that step yet, especially if you don't know if you're going to even like it. Um, there's a local quilt shop in my area that actually rents out time on a long arm machine. So you can either bring a quilt top that you have or bring just, you know, some sample just pieces of fabric and they will show you how to load it on the machine and you can just spend however much time you want um, practicing and seeing if that's even something uh, that you want to do. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, they, I'm seeing more and more of those types of shops popping up all over the place. Yep. Now, as soon as they start offering daycare, I'm, I'm in. I'm going to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Our next question here, um, Marissa says, you mentioned you just throw your quilts in the wash. Are you worried about your fabrics bleeding? Do you pre-wash your fabric? Um, I do not pre-wash my fabric. Um, uh, color that is used today in uh, quilt shop quality fabrics typically does not bleed. Uh, with that said, um, and, and I should say, I've never had any issues with anything bleeding and I've washed red, uh, you know, fabrics with red, uh, um, fabrics in them and I've never had any issue with that, but I do know that there are products on the market that you can throw in your washer, um, uh, that they're called color catchers and you can just throw those in the wash and, um, you shouldn't have any problems. Uh, I know, you know, it's so funny. It's one of those things about pre-washing fabrics. Some people swear by it and they would never do anything different. And then other people, it just doesn't bother them as much. And um, Ashley and I have talked about this before in previous uh, live chats. And I, I just, I like to get right to the project. So I don't pre-wash. Yep, and I think it's a perfect contrast because you don't pre-wash and a person we've had on here previously, she absolutely pre-washes with different types of pre-washing solutions. And so there's just, you're sort of, you know, you do it one way and that's just kind of how you go. I'm currently working on a quilt that does have white as well as dark reds and purples and all that. So I'm gonna find out whether or not those colors bleed and hopefully they don't. But you did mention quilt shop quality fabric. So if I'm not necessarily purchasing from a quilt shop, Maybe I'm buying from a big box store online. How do I know if my fabric is quilt shop quality fabric? Well, I mean, quilt shop quality fabric is sold at quilt shops. Um, Joanne Fabrics, um, some of their fabrics uh, are, like they have a certain section that are uh, quilt shop quality. Um, they also have, fab they also sell fabrics, cottons that are not quilt shop, uh, um, quality. Um, and gosh, that's, that's such a good question, Ashley. But I mean, quite frankly, no matter what I use, I, I specified quilt shop quality because I know for sure I don't have any issues. Um, if I were to use a lesser quality fabric in my quilts, uh, to be honest, I probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't bother me as much. Um, I might take Let's say that I got a, a piece of red uh, yardage from a yard sale. Um, you might want to um, just sort of do a test real quick and uh, see if that uh, would bleed. Um, and quite frankly, I'd probably want to wash that fabric. Probably, I don't know where it came from or where, That's true. you know. That's so. true. Perfect. All right, our next one here, it says a bunch of people have been asking uh, what the name of the Facebook group is that we've been talking about. I suppose we should have mentioned that. Yes, <laughs> that's National Quilter Circle Quilt Block Challenge. Yes. That's the name of a group. So you can either find it by specifically searching for National Quilter Circle, and then within that page, there's a link to it, or specifically it's NQC Quilt Block Challenge. So we shortened it up just a little bit so you didn't have to type in so much when searching it. Um, and you will have to, if you're not already a member of the page, you have to hit join and then there are admins. We are both one of them and we will make sure you're an actual person, not a robot, and then uh, add you to that group. So that's an easy way to get added to the Facebook group. And like we said before, if you're just now joining, you haven't done any of the projects before, Susan, if you wanna kind of explain 
how you have the files uploaded and where someone can find, say, week one? Okay, uh, the files um, are, we have a post that is pinned to the very top of the discussion thread, and Facebook is now calling that uh, announcements. Uh, they used to call it a pinned post, but now it's called announcements. Uh, right now in the group, there are two announcements that are out there. And I, I happen to notice this because I, I put actually the announcement of this uh, live chat. Um, uh, so what you'll do is when you when you go into the group, hit uh, along the left-hand side, you'll see discussion. Hit discussion, and the very first post that comes up will be um, one of the announcement uh, pinned posts. It's, it is pinned. Um, and then up in the, it'll be the right-hand corner, actually. Um, up in the right-hand corner, it'll say, I think it says like two posts or something like that. But it, it's, a, what you want to do is click on there if the appropriate one isn't um, right in front of you. But uh, anyway, it will show, uh, as of now, it shows week eight. You click on that link within that post. That will take you to uh, the uh, National Quilter Circle blog. Uh, which will show you week eight, but in addition to week eight, it lists all the rest of week, from week one through week eight, it has all the PDFs out there for uh, the entire pattern. One thing I would like to mention here is um, that the pattern is copyrighted. It is for uh, single person use only. So um, we ask that you not photocopy it and share it. I know we're getting to the end. So if you have any friends who are interested, please invite them uh, to join the group as well. And uh, they can get uh, the PDF on their own. Okay? Yep, absolutely. And not only, I mean, you get that PDF, you can get past challenge PDFs also, um, but just also in the file section, just because I know we've had some questions about it because people go to it and they see week eight. As we uploaded the files, they kind of stack on top of each other. So eight's up here and you have to scroll down to get to one. So if that's, uh, if you're having any issues, just scroll through and you'll definitely find them all. Uh, let's see. Victoria says, I have loved doing the Lexington sampler, Lexington Square sampler, Susan. Will you be doing another mystery quilt soon? Thank you so much for the wonderful blocks and instructions. <laughs> well, um, I uh, we haven't had any discussion with, or I have not had any discussions with uh, National Quilter Circle. I don't know if they're going, I believe they're going to be doing another one. Um, but I myself, I've, I've been thinking about uh, hosting one uh, through my website, and actually it would be through my blog. Um, my website is suzgoosedesigns.com. It's S-U-Z as in zebra, G-U-Z as in zebra, designs with an S on the end, uh, dot com. And uh, you can friend me on f through Facebook. I'll be announcing there when I'm ready uh, to release it. Uh, or uh, go ahead and um, contact me through my uh, website and I can put you on a mailing list. I'm, I'm restarting a mailing list that uh, um, I had going a while ago, but I'm starting to revive that again. Perfect. I'm going to have to sign up for that because I definitely want in on whatever quilts you're doing next. I do know that uh, National Culture Circle does want to continue doing um, challenges. I'm not sure how often we're going to do them. We've talked about every quarter or so. Um, so whenever we find out details on when that will be, we will definitely let you know either through our live events or through um, the challenge Facebook page or just our standard Facebook page. Uh, but we have time for about one more question here. Um, and this comes from Cheryl and she says, what is the difference between cotton and broadcloth and can you use them together in the same quilt? Um, the difference between cotton and broadcloth, broadcloth, uh, cotton is 100% cotton, broadcloth, cloth, sorry, <laughs> I believe is 50-50 polyester cotton. Uh, that's my understanding. Um, and you know what? I actually have used it uh, in the same quilt. Um, one of the quilts that I made for David Butler's book, um, we use broad cloth as well as cotton. And um, uh, what I ended up doing there was I pre-washed that cotton for him so that it, I didn't want him to have any issues with the quilt. But uh, I would recommend that if you do use broadcloth and cotton or some other, even wool or whatever you end up using, always pre-wash your fabrics for that, definitely. Just the broadcloth or everything? I would, I would pre-wash everything because there's different levels of shrinkage. 
for each one of those. If you're using 100% cotton, everything pretty much will shrink at the same rate. So that's why I would do that. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here to answer all of our questions this evening. I hope everyone got their questions in and got them answered. And I hope everyone is enjoying the sort of wrap up of this challenge. Again, you mentioned tomorrow is week nine comes out and then we're done. Um, but if you're just hearing about it, definitely still sign up and still participate. It's a lot of fun. And again, we'll let you know when any new ones are starting in the future. Um, and we will see you again, Susan, probably back next month to answer even more quilting questions. So I hope everyone has a great night. Bye.